This event uh, chaired by the Center for Arctic Humanities uh, with the title The Arctic uh, in the Anthropocene. Uh, the Center for Arctic Humanities is a newly established center at UAT, the Arctic University of Norway. It was opened by our rector, Dag Rune Olsen, December last year. It's supposed to coordinate uh, the various humanities environments at UAT, enhance their visibility, enable networking, and facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration. The humanities are needed to understand past, present, and future. Humans are, of course, immensely important in that context, but equally important are the relations between humans and nature. My name is Lily Mitner. I'm coordinating activities in the center, such, for example, this panel here. And um, this was planned together with Christoph <laughs> Schneider from Humboldt University of Berlin. Uh, with me, I have also my dear colleague, Marie-Therese Federhofer, professor in German literature and culture at the Department for Language and Culture and Weisstein for research at the Faculty of Humanities, Social Sciences and Education at UIT. Together, uh, Marie-Therese and me, we will guide you through this, uh, or all of us, <laughs> through this, hopefully smoothly, through this panel, uh, which has the purpose to bring humanities perspectives uh, into a given topic, which is the Arctic in the Anthropocene. And then we have with us some of the most distinguished scholars uh, within the arts and humanities at UIT, and I'm happy to bring you into conversation with scholars from the natural sciences. Um, unfortunately, we are missing uh, two people, Tone Hüse and Katrin Losleben, who cannot be with us uh, due to cancelled flies, but you see in the program all our names, and I hope you will uh, be able to uh, talk to each of us uh, afterwards if you have more questions. Um, so now I would like to invite you all to introduce yourself. Uh, probably, uh, and your field of expertise, and address the overall theme. As we agree, three minutes each, <laughs> we'll try. And after that, we will open for a panel conversation along with three topics. Um, and please think already now about some of uh, some questions you might have to each other. So here we go. Hanna, may you <laughs> start? Uh, nice to see all of you here. Uh, there's a lot of things to choose from, so you're lucky to be here, I guess. <laughs> uh, my name is Hanna Hamestian, and I'm an art historian and curator. I work as an associated professor at the Academy of Arts, which is part of UIT. Um, and I think I've always been interested in the entanglement between things. Um, and Anthropocene as a concept for me opens up for interdisciplinarity and to see things in relation instead of, of separating them or boxing them. And that I think is, is great. Uh, and as an art historian of the North, I have been quite frustrated about the idea or the image of the Arctic as pure, empty and endless um, that is informed by a lot of, of art that is done through, through history uh, and through time. Uh, and I think the Anthropocene helps us to question this idea about the Arctic. Um, that, and I think it's quite important that, that we do this. So for me, art history um, can offer this possibility of questioning uh, images and ideas and how they are connected. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. So Kora. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Kora Alexander Grunewog. I'm a visual artist. Uh, born, raised, and living in Tromsø. At the moment, I'm doing a PhD in artistic research between UIT and the University in Bergen. Uh, in my practice, uh, I'm investigating or I'm, I'm working with something I've coined multispecial uh, sculpture or architecture, if you want. And what I'm quite interested in is the sort of the cohabitation and how we live with other creatures. And specifically, right now, I'm working with a kitty wakes, which is a new inhabitant in Tromsø. Uh, and you can see one outcome of this work on the screen here. It's a mobile hotel for kitty wakes. Uh, and, and I thank you, Hanna, for that introduction. I think you also touched upon some of my interests there. And, and I think a lot of my work, I, I kind of addressed the Arctic, but not like directly, because I think also as a student uh, and for many years I've always been kind of critical to this idea that you know that the north it represents something unexplored something we have to learn about because and not something where we can get things from because I, I think like coming from here and working here I, I'm more interested in the perspective of this as a, 
a living landscape with people, with animals, and we've been here for a long time. So all these sort of fantasies that are sometimes sort of projected onto the north. So I, I think my way of sort of working with that is more to just working here and in sort of projects nested in this place and in the knowledge that is here. And I think there's there's also all these questions uh, like uh, a colleague of some colleagues of me, uh, Johan Angu and Celia Figenske Thuresen, they coined a term called indigenuity uh, 15 years ago or so. And I, I think it's a very good term like because it, it tells kind of also a story of how you relate to the landscape and how you can rework, rework or how you relate to the material reality around you uh, and I, I think if you're going to pick something in the north uh, like a sort of aesthetical sort of line I think that's a quite a good term um, I haven't really touched so much upon the Anthropocene but through like the Kittywake project uh, that is a direct consequence of warming oceans, you could say. Um, so I, I think uh, so much that we like we ex ex uh, experience already uh, a lot of quite severe consequences of that uh, in the north. And I would like to talk more about that, but now I give the mic away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Jonathan Crossan. I'm an associate professor at the Center for Sami Studies at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. I grew up uh, originally uh, outside Vancouver on, on unceded uh, Stalo lands, of the, particularly the Keetsi uh, and Kwantlen peoples, uh, and I've since moved here to, to Sapmi, so uh, you could call me a, a settler two times over. Uh, and um, I work here uh, primarily uh, as the, the program coordinator for a program called the a master's program called Governance and Entrepreneurship in Northern and Indigenous Areas, which is a, a interdisciplinary master's program uh, run jointly with the University of Saskatchewan uh, to facilitate uh, and develop human capacity in northern and indigenous areas. And I'm also a historian of indigenous internationalism, uh, particularly uh, in the Arctic. Uh, I, during my previous education, I had always thought of history as a humanity, and, and then I came here and was told that it's a social scientist. I didn't know I was a scientist the whole time. So uh, yeah, that's, that's it for now. Hello, I am uh, Marit Reista. I'm a professor in marine ecology um, and also at UIT here in Tromsø and also leading, uh, I think it's the largest research project in, in Norway at the moment, the Nansen Legacy, where we try to understand how the climate and the physical environment is impacting the ecosystem in uh, the seasonally ice-covered Arctic uh, that is changing quite rapidly right now. For me, it's uh, working in the Arctic, and I'm perhaps a little bit more <laughs> in the far away Arctic, in the ocean, and where we have sea ice, and where there are not so many humans um, that have been uh, at least living in our part of the Arctic. Um, the satellite images helped us to see uh, the dramatic changes in sea ice that we have uh, experienced the past decades since the end of the 1970s. Uh, this has kind of been an uh, indicator of the impact of global warming uh, on the Earth and the Arctic. And the impact has been a lot larger in the Arctic due to Arctic amplification. So it's a temperature warm that is about four times uh, as uh, at the Earth. And it has been a uh, inaccessible area uh, in many ways, but is increasingly getting accessible. So we are also learning more about the area. And we see that it's not only the sea ice that is melting, but it's also changing ecosystem and the ocean environment. But uh, global warming is just a tip of the iceberg. Uh, there is also many other things going on uh, that impacts the ecosystem, like contamination, like plastic, there is increasing human presence with tourist vessels, fisheries, petroleum. So uh, there are many different impacts. And despite all this uh, documentation and the knowledge, it's hard to see that we are taking the action that is needed to mitigate uh, this change. And that's why I think that despite having uh, 
worked in many, many years to connect and to get more holistic understanding of the Arctic by uniting natural scientists. I think that we also need uh, other types of science like humanities and art to communicate and to figure out how we can convey uh, the need to take proper action and to motivate people and politicians to actually uh, change. Thanks a lot. Um, my name is Christoph Schneider. I'm Vice President Research at Humboldt Universität in Berlin. Um, I have a background in uh, physics and geography, um, being professor for climate geography over the last, I don't know, some years. And I did work in remote places, both in the Arctic and elsewhere in the world. Uh, seeing the changes, I'm s obviously also observing that we are in the Anthropocene, so it's not only, for me, it's not only a theoretical concept, we are really there. Um, and then, well, back in, at Humboldt Universität, we have a center that's called Integrated Research Institute on Human Environmental Systems. So the human environment interaction, to me, is the core of the Anthropocene, basically. But the hu human part of this interaction p s certainly is framed by society, by economic circumstances, by our cultural uh, settings, by how we are seeing the world through art, through how we are living together and so forth. And in much of our research, I'm seeing that mm, there is, um, well, if I look at mm, physically based research, in the Arctic, whether it be on land or in uh, in, in the marine uh, systems, I'm seeing social sciences and art sometimes being attached as something that should inform the, the natural science approach. And I wonder whether this is actually really wh what we were looking at. I, I'm interested to learn how social sciences and arts and humanities at a broader scale take their own look at these remote areas at the Arctic and have their own right and their own view and their own perspective and don't rely on being important because they inform natural sciences. I mean, in the end, they should or they will then inform physical sciences. Um, and that's important because there is no such thing as an objective perspective on, on what you are researching on. Whatever your research interests are and whatever you think that as a natural scientist you're fully objective, that's not the case because the, 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 which are the questions that you are having against an item that you are looking at? What are your perspectives? What are the methods that you're using? That depends on many circumstances. It depends on your background, on your gender and so forth. And I think it's important that um, natural scientists are always in contact with the arts and the humanities so that they get an idea of, of how their perspectives may be twisted to the one or the other side. But that should not be by having an artist accompanying a um, expedition to the Arctic, but it should be by the full right of the arts themselves having a look at the north. And I would, I would wish to discuss this a little further. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to you all. Uh, as you see, we have a quite uh, cross-disciplinary group here. <laughs> um, and I think we, um, we start our conversation with uh, talking about these two prominent concepts, which are part of our title, the Arctic and the Anthropocene. Uh, so we have already heard some of your thoughts about how to connect and to think about uh, these concepts, but I guess that not all of us share the same idea, the same thoughts. What is the Arctic? What is the Anthropocene? How does a natural scientist think about, uh, about the Anthropocene versus how does an artist think about the, the, uh, the Anthropocene? And the same for the Arctic. Um, as a statement, you could say the Anthropocene um, is an established concept. It was established by the natural sciences. It's very often used in the humanities and in the arts. And it's probably an indicator for that humanity, or at least part of humanity, 
um, is responsible for the current critical situation, condition of the bio and geosphere. The Arctic, what is the Arctic? Could we say that the Arctic is a location, just to pick up your words in the beginning, Lily, a location where the past, present, and future of the environmental and geopolitical uh, systems are played out? Could we say so? So my suggest, uh, suggestion would be just let us discuss, talk about uh, these concepts, Anthropocene, Arctic, how do they connect to each other? And I start with you, we just do the round <laughs> again. Uh, Christoph, would you like to say something? How do you think as a natural scientist about the Anthropocene and the, the Arctic? How yeah, yeah. Mm. I start with the Anthropocene first. I think mm. Paul Crutzen, the Nobel Prize winner, was the person who introduced the term at, a, at, a, at least widely into the scientific debate. And I mean, to me, it's clear it's, it's this part of Earth history where humankind is the, the major driver of forces on, on mm. Earth. And well, when, when does it start? Is it, is it, is it some 10,000 years ago when we started to do agriculture on Earth and, and herding? Or is it, does it, did it start 1950 when you, in the course of the Great Acceleration, you can see that environmental impacts all around the world really got <laughs> speeded up at exponential um, um, terms. And I mean, s now we have plastic um, rubbish all over the coastlines in the Arctic, everywhere, uh, even on places where there is no settlements around. Um, we can we can see industrial products in uh, sediments all over the world, mm -hmm. also in Antarctica and in the, in the Arctic. So we are clearly clearly in the in the Anthropocene, and that's latest since the 1950s, I guess. Um, now, the question is, what do we do with this? And um, I would want to take a phrasing that I have from Johann Rockström, director of the uh, Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research from a Swedish guy, saying that it's now time that we make ourselves to the stewards of planet Earth so that we are taking care of this planet. No, it's not our enemy. Nature is not our enemy anymore. We are not exploiting the planet, or actually we shouldn't do any, any further, but we should rather take care of the planet. Taking care of the planet is a completely different concept, and I think this must be the outcome of the Anthropocene. Now, if you look at the Arctic, I mean, as a geographer, I have to say, yes, it's a region, it's a location. It's, I don't know, the 10 July, the, it's the 10 degree centigrade uh, line around the Arctic uh, in July or something like this. But I know it's not true. Yeah, if I also did a little bit of human geography and clearly the Arctic is also a concept. So it's not necessarily a region or a location. I mean, there are locations that are clearly in the Arctic, mm -hmm. but there is also a concept of the Arctic and that's not so much a geographical thing, but it's rather, Mm. What is it? I leave that to the others. I think they know more about it. <laughs> wow, that was something to get. <laughs> 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 so if I uh, should just take the ball and uh, my immediate response, maybe s Arctic is something about culture because we live uh, quite close to the nature, we're exposed to a lot of seasonality. Uh, it's often a climate that impacts our way of living. And that's one of the reasons why I thrive here. I, uh, when there is weather like today, you, uh, you feel that you're kind of small because uh, you, you can't really uh, necessarily do whatever you want. You have to adapt to uh, what uh, the conditions uh, allow you to. And I think that's characteristic for what people in the North uh, have had to do through all times. Uh, you have to adapt and you have to live with nature uh, because that's the, the only way that works. Mm. But um, for me, the Anthropocene, um, you came with nice... Uh, definitions that I fully agree, uh, but when I go to the Arctic and to areas where there are not many people living, we still see that all the changes that take place there is caused by people living far away. So it's a footprint of activity at lower latitude where people live that is transported uh, with uh, ocean currents and with uh, wind all the way to the north, and it's really impacting the north. 
Mm. So uh, that uh, humans are able to change uh, the climate and uh, ecosystem both uh, on land and in the water and in the atmosphere through the way we uh, live and use resources uh, that's uh, Anthropocene and it things are happening so quickly that the normal way of adapting is not enough for many of the organisms. So um, I think maybe i leave it with that. Uh, perhaps just a question, uh, Mario, because you said uh, we see the, the effects uh, of modernity also in the, in the Arctic by the Anthropocene, but um, caused by people not living in the, the, in the Arctic. Um, and this is maybe also a problem with this word Anthropocene and the Anthropos, the man, being in the middle, but it's not all. It's not all the humanity who is responsible. So we could keep that probably in mind because we are affected by activities done by people not living here in the Arctic. And uh, I'm thinking about also about the indigenous communities. So when we go further with, um, probably you want to say something about that, uh, Jonathan. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, was, uh, that was more or less uh, what I was going to say about the awareness about the use, use of the term Anthropocene for, for exactly that, that reason. And, and not that, uh, th I guess that that responsibility is not evenly distributed rather than saying that um, that people living here have had no effect, but that that it's that uh, the the weight of that responsibility, uh, sh sh you know, it's, it makes sense from a natural science uh, perspective to say, yeah, humans did this, but f from uh, social sciences or humanities, it's it's not evenly distributed uh, according to uh, both culture and ethnicity and, and class and all sorts of other uh, reasons. Uh, and that's for one definition, as you're talking about about more modern changes. Um, but if you take a, a longer term perspective, there's a risk of, uh, of uh, having an image of that there was a time when humans lived in perfect harmony with nature and that there was no like or that there were no inter that that interaction did not leave lasting changes. Um, and of course, it always has since time immemorial indigenous peoples have uh, interacted with their their territories and, and left marks. Um, so, uh, so I think we should be wary of both of those definitions, um, and I'm also wary of, of the idea of the Arctic, because uh, it certainly means something very different uh, here, living here in Trumso, than than it would living uh, in the Arctic, uh, in North America. Um, so, uh, so I think uh, you know we use the North in our in our program. That's that's equally uh, challenging, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but certainly uh, there are there are lots of similarities between. Life in northern Saskatchewan, uh, with with life uh, much further north um, in other places in the world, even though Saskatchewan's a long way from the Arctic Circle. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah, um, kind of maybe almost follow a bit up on that. Um, I, I also think like the the Anthropocene, uh, it's kind of a, a useful uh, notion, but I, I kind of favor a more sort of backdated start of the Anthropocene. I think it's Gilkson who uh, made a case for it being backdated a couple of millions year, couple of million years to uh, Homo erectus. And I think the reason I, I like it, it, it's a more complex definition in the sense that it, it also messes with the whole idea of when did we become human and because if I think there's one thing that's important that is like we need to establish a better relation with the rest of the ecosphere and see yourself more connected like in all research you know you we have long it's a long time since we dumped the whole dichotomy between nature and culture but I think it's still very much present and I, I, so that's why I kind of favor this more complicated idea of the uh, Anthropocene also because it's because as you mentioned it also has this sort of anthropocentric uh, notion that is a bit problematic but this backdated uh, to the f like ash layer of the Homo erectus I, I just think it opens up more possibilities in a way um, and to, to comment on the um, on the Arctic I was going to say something which is a bit silly Sometimes I feel it's a bit like the Norwegian term Sweden. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, like it, it's, it's not very precise to say it like this. Uh, but it, I, I think it can be useful in the sense of sort of uh, 
lateral unity around uh, the northern part of the globe because we have some of the same challenges in a sense. Uh, and one challenge I think is import especially important is that you know, technology transfer usually goes a bit more like east-west. Uh, you can use the same kind of technology in France as you can in China. You know, it's roughly the same climate, some kind of same conditions. But you don't have the same going north-south. So a lot of sort of knowledge or technology developed further south doesn't really transfer north very, very well. It, al it always comes with some unintended consequences, if it's a technology or if it's like law or regulations. So uh, that's also why I think it's so important that we have knowledge production uh, in the north, like UIT. Uh, and I think uh, also for, you know, geopolitical reasons, you know, collaborations between the different sort of states surrounding the north uh, has been difficult. And you don't have like direct flights, like you don't have the sort of infrastructure around. We're, we're always having to relate to some capital region further south. So I think we have a lot of work to do there yeah yeah what to pick up on <laughs> uh, maybe getting back to this idea that I said like the um, my frustration um, also growing up here and and being educated here and working as an art historian from from this point in the world um, the frustration with this romantic idea about this empty and and pure and clean and uh, the Arctic, um, I guess I guess that is why the Anthropocene, um, the concept of the Anthropocene, when it's coupled with the Arctic, that it's making people understand. Because we, of course, there's a lot of impact going on also in the South that we don't see because it's messy already. But if we if we find plastic in at Svalbard, we react like it's... Um, it's somehow the idea of this purity uh, coupled with the like the Anthropocene makes it more, you know, understandable. Maybe that it, it's out of our hands almost. Because also because, I mean, if even if we said it's not the the thing, it's not the people in the Arctic who, who you know, um, are are uh, responsible for the plastic in the Arctic. But anyhow, we are in the chain of the whole global system, so we can't anymore, you know choose who's or figure out who's responsible of course responsibility coming back to this um that some people or some states or whatever are more responsible but we are kind of almost all of us um even if there's a lot of people not without a cell phone we all almost all of us have them so uh i think and i think that's where the art comes in that there's a lot of interest in the Arctic because of this because it's a, a way of imagining it's easy to imagine it's easy to of course this has always been a kind of a green screen the Arctic uh, it's you can now project all these other like future images or post-human images or what will happen uh, or what will go on when we are not here anymore um, a photo historian or a theoret theoretical person is starting talking about what about photography without human beings. There are still photographic processes going on. Um, uh, also talking about how we change the conditions for images by changing the changes lights of the Anthropocene. That there are different, like with Turner, those of you who know from the British painter, when he, uh, with the industrialization, when he made these foggy images because of the, all the, uh, what do you call it, the damp coming out of the industrial production. So, I mean, also there's a connection between, uh, I guess, um, the way we can imagine uh, in, in a world where we are affecting everything. Um, and I think that's where humanities come in. We have to uh, also figure out what concepts can we think with to kind of think new thoughts. And um, I guess that's where Anthropocene have been, it's been so popular within the arts because it makes us think different things uh, and imagine new worlds. Um, and you said something about like, uh, that of course humanity got us there, but of course there's been a lot of other uh, thoughts and concepts than the late capitalist thinking. It's quite new in huma human history. There's been a lot of different ways of thinking about nature that we can 
you know, bring forth, um, not only in indigenous thinking. So um, I think that is where we need to kind of start uh, working with natural scientists to work with questions together instead of on each our sides. Um, mm -hmm. And then we can come up, I guess, with more uh, interesting and projects and yeah. Mm. I have the mic, thank you. <laughs> I, I think it's very interesting to listen to all of you, and I, while I listen, I hear the wind. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it all the time very strongly. And it's this, this what you said, how can we think differently and with different concepts and um, in order to have a dialogue across disciplines, uh, which has been also established as part of a project which defined a specific way of thinking, what is human, what does the human. So in order to, to mix it up and towards another future, I think we really should think with the wind, <laughs> with the storm outside, and um, yeah, try to create something new in research. That's what researchers do and artists do normally. So um, you have many different approaches to Arctic and Anthropocene. Um, and uh, Let's move further and become a bit more concrete. So if we try to use examples from our research now and think what it means, what does it mean to live in the Anthropocene here <laughs> in the Arctic? Uh, some of you have worked really empirical, and I would like to ask Kore <laughs> at first about current challenges, both environmental or societal. So um, can you tell us about this project with the kitty wakes uh, and how you address the Arctic in your research questions. Yeah, so um, <coughs> a sh short introduction um, to the uh, kitty wake project. Uh, it's uh, several years ongoing uh, cross disciplinary uh, project uh, where we have uh, I've been collaborating with uh, scientists at uh, Nina. Rune Kristin Reijersen and Karl Otto Jakobsen, uh, working with the architecture company at Plan Architektur, uh, with the architect Kjell Nash, uh, another artist and colleague, Lawrence Malstaff, Tromsø Kunstforening, and the municipality of Tromsø. And with also input from several others. Um, I, I think it's... Uh, the, the sort of the challenge we've been trying to address is a new inhabitant of Tromsø, which is an endangered species called uh, Risa tridactyla, or Kiriwake in English, Kriche in Norwegian. First pair was obser observed on Tromsø Island in 2015, uh, and they've bred quite quickly, and they've had success in town. Uh, the Kiriwake is a cliff breeding species, uh, often found uh, on cliffs far away from hu po human population centers. Uh, but in Tromsø, the analog they've found to cliffs are building facades. Uh, typically, uh, details on the building, on older buildings, window sills on newer buildings. And this has raised a certain level of conflict uh, with the stakeholders, uh, users of the buildings. And kind of first reaction when they started to sort of become a lot it became a problem the newspaper was writing quite a lot about it and a lot of this was kind of like catastrophe you know we have to get rid of them they're destroying the town uh, this we have to like put a glass roof over the whole town or I think actually Nuri is the regional newspaper actually wrote on a leader that we should shoot them all even though they're endangered um, and I, I kind of just thought that this was truly embarrassing. Um, we were a coastal town in the northern part of Norway. We'd been living with and from the oceans for millennia. Uh, and that we can't deal uh, with the, such a small consequence of global warming. Uh, and when I say that, there, there's been some studies suggesting that the warming of the, the warmer ocean is like a 40% uh, uh, to the cause of why the Kitty Wakes has moved to town, uh, along other sort of uh, um, causes. Uh, but that we can deal with that uh, at such a small scale, that we can deal with a few more Kitty Wakes in t uh, or seagulls in town. And I just thought like we have to be able to find like a smarter way of dealing with this, where where we can sort of live together, like some kind of buffer uh, 
Um, and so we've uh, worked uh, closely with scientists and this is like a pilot project. The, the building these kitty wakes were living on was going to be completely renovated. So we had, they were going to cover the whole building. And the municipality actually put down uh, in the regulations that they needed to do uh, some like a positive uh, thing for the kitty wakes. So we developed these uh, mobile kitty wake uh, hotels, uh, trying to like get all the sort of known research and how they should be uh, uh, developed. Um, and I, but I think maybe some one of the more like important things we found out is kind of making a sort of platform where we can work together and being able to across sort of all these different disciplinaries and also re like recognizing that so much of the responsibility uh, for these birds is kind of all over the place. Um, so trying to just uh, collect all the responsibility in one group, I think. Uh, and, and to mention, that you, you asked also about the Arctic. Uh, and for me, this is kind of the essence of Arctic for me. Like I live here, I, I work here, and I want to develop things that work here in this climate, in this region. So it's this sort of situatedness, uh, in a way, I would say. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Coral. Are there any questions to Coral? So you can also ask each other. Now we open a bit more up. We don't go this <laughs> back and forth all the time. Uh, otherwise, I would like to ask also uh, Jonathan uh, how you in your research work with relations and with the material. Also what, what are you doing concretely in order to address Arctic issues? Or what you would define as Arctic hmm. issues? Um, hmm. I, I guess... Uh, Maybe in terms of the the um, program um, that I'm that I'm working with uh, is is one thing that we're that we try to do is is have our students uh, as as I mentioned a uh, very multidisciplinary um, uh, group of students to do work uh, in their communities and outside of academia. So all of these master students have the opportunity to have a have a, a, a what we call an applied research project where they're working with. Businesses and uh, and uh, levels of government, NGOs, that sort of thing, to do research uh, on on behalf of, of those uh, those organizations, to uh, to move outside of, of academia and apply the kind of acad ac various academic skills that they've uh, learned in the program uh, to those other 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 contexts and and, and develop that capacity for work uh, and business uh, and that sort of thing uh, in their own communities. Mm. Not sure if that's what you're looking for. But. Yes, it was some insight from from your research. Now we are on the research <laughs> topic. Yeah. I, I find the Kitty Hawk example really interesting. Because, I mean, we have a lot of research in Berlin on the urban wilderness, which is more and more important, especially because in the more industrialized agriculture regions around, sometimes there is less biodiversity that you can find on on the suburban fringes, actually, and that's quite interesting. And <clears throat> there is a, a huge scene that tries to uh, guard the urban wilderness with foxes and rabbits, and I mean, th those are the most dominant species, but there's also a lot of birds that you hardly find outside of town that have kind of made friends with the urban environment. And, and I think this is an important uh, issue to, for us as humans also, to be able to make friends with those creatures that live with us in urban environments. Um, I also like your <laughs> discussion of the Anthropocene going back to Homo erectus. I'm not sure whether I would follow this because, I mean, the African elephant also has a huge and important impact on the tropical rainforest in Africa, but we wouldn't talk about the Elephantocene or something like this. Uh, I think the reason is because it's not global, and I don't think that the impact of Homo erectus at that stage really was global, or at least we can't see it globally in the records. That's, but then, what does it mean that the impact is global? And here I find, maybe I can introduce another term that's the, in, in natural science, we say the teleconnections, for example, in the atmosphere. If you transfer the concept of teleconnections, so remote con connections between regions, um, it's called telecouplings. That means it's coupled somehow. And it's also coupled in terms of social system and economic system. It's about world trade. It's about tourism. It's about plastic being in the ocean currents. That's also a kind of a teleconnection and coupling. 
And I think the Anthropocene somehow needs the telecoupling and the teleconnections to become glo a global phenomenon. And that then also plays out in the Arctic, as you said, that much of what happens in the Arctic actually is an impact that comes from outside of the Arctic, whatever, wherever the, the boundary between Arctic and non-Arctic is. And somehow the Arctic is a good um, example for s uh, many other regions, large areas on the globe, where the consequences of those few of humankind that produce the impact on Earth have large consequences elsewhere on other continents, like for much of Latin America, Africa, and part of Asia, their global impact is actually not really large compared to Europeans, North Americans, Chinese, and so forth, because of their economic impact is not as large. And in, in that sense, maybe parts of Africa are pretty similar to the Arctic. They are in, they are in the Anthropocene and with global, global change, climate change, and biodiversity loss and so forth, they are affected by something that they are not really responsible for. But how? what does that say for the communities in the Arctic? Are, is then, are you just a victim then in the Arctic? Which I don't believe, but it, it, it poses interesting questions, I think. I was, uh, I was actually thinking um, on similar lines, uh, when you were talking about w what makes the Arctic uh, special is, is the kind of the distance from the, the metropole that you have to, if you want to travel to northern Finland, you have to travel south first. Um, and so I was thinking of that uh, in relation to, um, say, uh, West African countries wanting to send mail to each other and has to go through France uh, and then back again. Um, and so I think there's something to be said for thinking of the Arctic, uh, what it has in common as a region is that uh, history of of, uh, of serving as a, a, a colony or a territory, uh, and that history is, as you said, makes it not so different than m many other places uh, in the world. And then our ability to not deal uh, with uh, the legacies that we've caused in terms of climate change is really reminiscent of our our, uh, our inability to kind of deal with the, all of the kind of present issues that that have been caused by that history of, of colonization around the world that that are uh, c you know coming back to 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 Europe um in Europeans who are, who are unable to to deal with with the the kind of ramifications of that history mm. I I would like to pick up on something on the Kitty Wake project because I think one of the good examples is that um and you can see it as an area conflict between the Kitty Wake and uh, our urban way of living. And area conflict is uh, something that we see very many places. And uh, it's a challenge of how to find good solutions. And that you are sitting down together with natural scientists, architects, the municipality and artists, and come up with a solution that was kind of... Um, uh, good for for all the different parts involved, I think is a very good example of how we perhaps have to think about area conflicts that we also have both on land and increasingly in the sea, that when we are going to uh, do something, we have to identify uh, who are uh, the different interests and how can we put together a different uh, expertise is to find a solution that minimize the impact or the footprint and enable both the, the, the ecosystem and the, the species to survive. And uh, it can also facilitate the, the human uh, life and, and needs that we have. So I, I, I like that and would like to see that we could do that for, for also other challenges. Could I have a question first, and then you can answer? <laughs> because I, I think uh, I know Koda from from uh, many years ago. So I know that he's been doing a lot of projects that ha didn't work. You know, that didn't work out. Uh, and I think that's one of the good things <laughs> about the arts <laughs> is that we can. I mean, I that this is how I I um, uh, you know divide science and the arts is that we. We can talk about truth in the arts, but we can do it with 
fact, fake news <laughs> without trying to make you know fake news as they do it in the states <laughs> but i mean we we do it with fiction and then we would like to say something that is true or can be an example or whatever and for you you for many years you did projects that might didn't work work out you could you could like play around in a different way maybe than than scientists can and um, so also maybe if you could say something about your work how you did work with getting to this type of the hotel because there's a lot of failing involved and i think that's what in capitalism we don't have time for failing and i think if we're going to solve this crisis and i think time anyhow whatever is kind of a key uh, for sustainability uh, that we use time and we we see time as pressure and and instead of like trying to <laughs> overcome time so uh, maybe to say something about method also how you kind of experimented your way it's a bit of a <laughs> tricky question, uh, where to begin and where to <laughs> end. Uh, but yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, I've always been interested in the sort of uh, connection between art and science or, or, or sort of the connection between make-believe and real or what's out there. So I always find it kind of tantalizing to try to put projects on that knife edge where you can kind of tip both ways. Um, and in that case, you could say that this uh, project is a bit atypical in a sense, uh, but it does also contain quite a lot of material experimentation uh, for the simple fact uh, that we needed to make these mobile kitty wake towers light enough to be moved by a human hand, you know. So we had a late, uh, like a, we, we knew it had to be six meters tall. Uh, we, it shouldn't weigh more than 200 kilos uh, and it has no foundation so it has a center weight that keeps it down so the wind doesn't blow it. It's actually being, being tested really properly today. <laughs> 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 the best test so far. So, um, but, and I was working quite intuitively because there are, there's many ways to solve this and we made a couple of different varieties but I was very adamant about that I wanted to have something that was sort of replicating or looking a bit like some kind of mountain-ish, a bit like pastiche of a mountain in a way. I, I wasn't very clear maybe why I just needed to us to have this version with this because it's kind of a cumbersome way to do the other one were made much easier it's just cnc cut stuff and it's like chuck, chuck, chuck. Uh, very simple but after seeing them in use i think i then i kind of understood why i needed it to be like this and it's when the kitty wakes use use these structures over time they transform them as well and when they nest on buildings or on sort of on in quotes, clean architecture, it looks like they're messing up the place. They look like a foreign element. Uh, whereas when on this sort of mountainy, pastiche kind of looking one, they actually add kind of patina to it. Uh, it looks like they belong there, basically. Uh, and I think for like the perception and how we sort of, we experience it as, a, as people, that's quite important. Uh, and to comment on the material used there, it's a mishmash. It's it's a, a lot of uh, polyurethane foam keeping this up, and it's like a big no-no. I really wish I could find something other, like very light, nice material to use. But I'm actually working on that as we speak now. I'm, I've been sitting and uh, developing new shapes uh, for the last week. So we are building a, a larger version uh, qu quite soon. So. I tried to answer, it wasn't a very great answer. Uh, and now I actually kind of a little bit forgot the uh, one from this side. Um, it was kind of a question, can you repeat a bit? It uh, was about the area planning. Yes. Uh, yeah. If that's something that we can also transfer to other challenges, windmills? Uh. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think so. Like the, um, like uh, one of my ambitions with this project, and I think the rest of the group, is actually to change area planning. Uh, and one representative from the municipality actually said so, yeah, like we need to set off uh, areas for them. Just as we set off areas, you know, to have uh, snow because we have to let storage snow around because that's part of our town, but they are also part of our town, so we should put off area for them. 
uh, but I think as a model for resolving areas of conflict, uh, this kind of large round table where discussions where you, you can sort of gather all the stakeholders. And I, I, but I think it's very important to have good meetings, like positive meetings, that you're able to meet each other as people uh, and not have a war going on, but like slowly getting to know each other and trying to find compromises, because there's always compromises, there's never enough money, there's always, always some angry neighbors. Uh, and you know, but I, but I think I really genuinely believe like we need to talk together and we need to be generous with with one another. Yeah. Yeah. And just a small comment on the Anthropocene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not going to question the science. I I, I think it's more like a, a thought experiment. But I, I could send you it's it's a published paper on this. So uh, so it's not taken completely out of the air. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have a question for you, Marit, now, because I was thinking, how could you trans like the, the, this project, which is in the urban space, and where you work, uh, where there are not that many human beings, uh, pe people are passing by, or, yeah. Could you see a project, like a restoring project, or something, uh, in a different size, where you work? I think it's possible to answer on very, very many layers. I think the way we are having management plans is a way to kind of find uh, solutions with many different actors around the table of what uh, are the different interests, uh, what are the impact, and, and how to do that. And uh, I uh, was sitting in a side event earlier today where it was uh, exemplified how that if you had trans-sectoral or multi-sectoral uh, groups sitting together, you often found solutions with uh, less conflicts than if it was only one group. And it was uh, an example of where um, the uh, ocean uh, windmills uh, are planned and placed outside what is suggested as especially vulnerable areas in the ocean while uh, the ocean mining uh, areas is kind of falling on top of where you have the most vulnerable areas. And uh, so sitting around the table and discussing and trying to find good solution, uh, putting the different perspectives uh, on the table, uh, I think is a valuable uh, way about restoring. I think um, you have examples like uh, uh, the uh, seaweed and macroalgae, uh, which has been grazed down uh, of sea urchins, where now groups have uh, smashing the uh, sea urchins and allowing uh, seaweed to, to grow, and that's facilitating uh, areas where uh, fish can grow up and hide, so it's kind of restoration of, of important ecosystems. So I think that there are a lot, and, and here there is also groups of scientists, it's uh, uh, diving clubs, and uh, some are harvested for restaurants to kind of use them as food. So it's, it's possible to find solution, but often it's small scales and it, the questions are large, so mm -hmm. how are we able to scale up and find good solutions? And going back to Arctic and the Anthropocene, I think we are at the stage where there is urgent uh, to, to find solution to decrease the CO2 release because we are warming the, the globe at a speed that hasn't happened before, at least not with this many people that requires food and stability to, to survive. And, and that, I think, is one of the major changes that we have. So we also need to find a, a way to sit down and to solve the, the large questions and to actually uh, do what is needed. And there, I think that natural sciences has done uh, a job to do the documentation, but I think that there is a need for for others to, to also join in to help uh, a transformation in the way we use the Earth. Yeah, so maybe we could almost say that like uh, in the Arctic you're also 
uh, sort of on the forefront uh, of a lot of these changes. They come here first, mm -hmm. so we get the first uh, sort of chance to take a crack uh, at some of the problems that arises in a sense. But but I also uh, agree completely. You know that, uh, and I, that's kind of my main interest with these kind of projects. It's, it's it sort of cuts down to the question about who we are as a society, what is a town, what sort of values do we appreciate. Uh, and But apart from that, of course, it's like terrifying the, the loss of species is maybe like the most terrifying consequence of this. And then especially considering deep sea mining in areas where we literally don't, we don't have no almost what's there like it's all uh, like what I, I this is anecdotally and you can answer this but could you say something about what we know about the species in this area do you because uh, uh, my impression is that every time you go out with a vessel and you scrape a bit there's like always some new stuff that <laughs> 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 no but uh, actually we uh, we don't know very much about the deep ocean and uh, this structure that are particularly interested for ocean mining is where you have this um, uh, activities of seeps and there are kind of uh, chemicals uh, that comes out from the deeper parts of the earth and that gives rise to uh, chemosynthetic society, organisms that can live from these chemicals. They don't necessarily need the sunlight to produce energy. So, but it's very, very hard to study them. And now with technology, we're able to go down with uh, remote vehicles, with cameras and light to f see what's there. The challenge is just that it takes time to, to map it. And when you have mapped it visually, you also have to understand what are the organisms, what kind of interactions, what kind of role do they play. And one thing is the organisms, but they also do services. They're part of the ocean uh, element cycling, uh, so part of the kind of like you have bacteria and small worms in the soil that breaks down organic material and renews it as fertilizing the next spring's growth. And similarly, uh, the ocean sediment is a site where you have you decomposing uh, organic matter and you're recycling nutrients, and that is a kind of a service that goes on in all the, the deep oceans, but it takes a long, long time to make the chemical structure uh, that you need for all these processes to go on. So when you come and you destroy it, uh, it's not saying that, oh, maybe this was a good idea or bad idea that we, we shouldn't do that. And with everything we don't see underneath the, the surface of the ocean, until not very many years ago, it was a tradition in many Norwegian municipalities that you just dumped it in the fjord. You, you didn't have a proper waste handling system, so you burned what could be burned. Uh, you threw uh, food remains to the animals and everything that was larger, whether it was a car or a tractor or whatsoever. Uh, you dumped it in the fjord. And now we kind of see that this garbage that we let into the ocean is kind of coming to the surface. It becomes so much uh, that it's, uh, it's a huge problem. And similarly, if we are going to work on ocean mining and we don't really know the consequences, we don't know what it could be, and we, we won't be able to see it, it takes quite a lot of effort to be able to both investigate what is there, not to talk about the consequences of, uh, of our activities. So I think it's just way too early. And there are many, many species we, we don't know yet that we discover. So, yeah. If I may, I may go on. Actually, <clears throat> I think there's many valid ideas about what's the Anthropocene, so they can stand <laughs> next to each other and be friends. That's no problem at all. Um, I also think that when I when I listen to you, so it comes up to me that if humans are making friends with other creatures and, and other parts of the natural systems around them or that w which they are part of, it seems to me that it's the first step is to make friends with those creatures and all of those items that are uh, making up the environment we're living in. And after that, it 
probably easier for us to make friends with ourselves. So with those conflicts that we have within society and between different societies around the world. So it's very important, I think, to well raise children in the awareness of their entanglement with nature and create or other creatures. And that brings me to the fact that I mean, you've been saying so bluntly, we just have to bring carbon dioxide down. I think this is a really a, an easy problem compared to what you've just been talking about, those complex ecosystem responses. Combating climate change is really easy. Bring down carbon dioxide emissions, as simple as that. If it doesn't happen, or it, at least it doesn't happen at the speed that I would think it should over the last 30 years. And I've been discussing this for over 25 years with school classes, with, with managers from big companies, with student classes, and all kinds of club events. Everybody says, yes, sure, and I can see the science, and it's important. I mean, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen neither on a political level, nor at a societal level, nor at an individual level. I mean, I've been flying into Tromsø last night. That's a bit of a carbon footprint as well. I mean, we could have had this as a hybrid event. It's not that much fun, but it would be possible. Didn't do it. So, why is that? And brings me back to if we take care of the ecosystem items around us, the animals, the plants, and what's the rivers, the glaciers, if they would have their own stand in our perception, how would that change the world? And I maybe those indigenous people could tell us something about it. I think in it's New Zealand where one of, some of the rivers have their own legislative individual uh, sub personality where there's a law, a lawyer that that can raise a case in front of court for the river, with the river saying, look, you're doing this and that to me, and it harms me, and how, how can we deal with this? I would love to see Kongsbrain having a lawyer that brings a case to the Oslo court, say, look, uh, or, or to the United Nations, saying, uh, what you're doing is a harm to me as a glacier, and how would you please compensate for that? That'd be interesting to see. So, um, and, and it, it seems to me that this is a cultural perspective to the world that we are lacking at the moment because we are so uh, kind of distant to those systems that we, we don't make them ourselves. While we are actually we are so much part of it that we, we can't really separate from nature, that's impossible. Yeah, I would uh, I would just say that in terms of what you were saying about um, you know the the importance of bringing together local key stakeholders to to uh, come up with policy decisions and and how that can be ap applied at a, a larger scale, um, I was immediately brought to mind uh, the Arctic Council um, and and what an important uh, organization that is in terms of bringing together not just the Arctic states but uh, the indigenous per permanent participants. Who have such a key role in in uh, in guiding the organization and and, and its uh, its policies and and that sort of thing and so so in terms of the future of the Arctic, I think that's that's something that really s scares me about the the threats to the Arctic Council right now is is what a great model I mean imperfect model uh, but what a great model it is for for bringing together stakeholders to form relationships um, and uh, and to move policy forward in a way that that. Uh, satisfies everyone. Mm. Um, just a um, comment on, um, or again, I would like to recur on this concept of uh, Anthropocene, which was criticized because, again, man is in the center and it's centralizing the, the mankind and humanity. Um, this is one side, but I, w I would like to, um, to cite um, an historian, f philosopher, uh, Dipresh Chakrabarti. Uh, who has dealt a lot with this concept of the Anthropocene. And what he said is, um, so I, I would like to hear if you are, agree upon that or not. Um, what he says is, okay, mm, we have this Anthropocene, mankind has, is responsible for all these uh, changes, but what we need now is a sort of enlightened anthropocentrism, because only man, hum humanity, is able to solve the problems uh, which mankind has 
done or caused. Uh, so when you say, uh, Christoph, um, yes, it's very good that also the mountains, the rivers have their rights on their own. How do you think this is a sort of um, contrast to this idea of enlightened anthropocentrism that we need now, uh, according to Chakrabarti, or um, I don't know if you agree, is it really, also, if I hear about your project, Corey, I mean, you, mankind, humanity is discussing the problems and trying to solve it. So can we think about that, a sort of we need now a sort of enlightened anthropocentrism, again, sitting, putting mankind in the center, which didn't well in the past? <laughs> it's an open question. And yes. uh, so like, uh, like uh, in my presentation, I said, uh, like I, I want to work with sort of multi-special architecture, and there is some inherent paradoxes in it, of course, because I can't ask the Kiriwik directly, like, how would you like your house to be? That would have been so easy, yeah. by the way. Um, so we are, in a sense, in some senses, left to sort of uh, to our own devices, it, but it does like to say that there. But but on the other hand, you know, it's. There is some communication cross species, you know. Uh, we can learn, we can observe, uh, we can see if they thrive. So I, I just have to say, I'm talking a bit around the porridge here, as we would say in Norwegian, because I'm, I'm not very familiar with this idea of sort of enlightened anthropocentrism. I'll let you say it, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, mm. uh, yeah, I'll actually mm. quit there. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, we are in the driver's seat, whether we want it or not, we are in the driver's seat. And you, you can't just simply then put your hands off the wheel and say, it's not my business, it's mm. nature, and that doesn't work. Mm. We are in the driver's seat, mm. so we have to take responsibility. It's us to, to take stewardship for planet Earth. And if, for example, it'd be a good idea to give a river or a glacier its own right in front of court so that it helps us having the right decisions while being in the driver's seat as humanity, uh, fine to me. It's I mean it's different concepts that seem to be conflicting, but mm. actually not to me. And, and but if if you if you um, go a, um, one step further from Johann Rockström and others' concept of the global boundaries, where they say that it's about taking care for the planet, uh, you come to this nice donut um, economic theory of of Kate Roberts, who says. Well, but it's not only about meeting the planetary boundaries, you also have to need the social and economic um, necessities of, of mankind for people everywhere on the planet. So there is also, um, it's also about justice be between different people on Earth. So it's not only a safe operating space that we have to create on the planet, keeping the ecological boundaries. It's also about creating a just operating space. And it's really about an operating space. It's us in the driver's seat. You, uh, well, you, you can say, well, we don't want to have an anthropocentric uh, approach, but does that help? It is an anthropocentric world. That's what the anthropocene is. There's no way out. You have to take responsibility, as far as I can see. Yes, taking responsibility and taking it collectively, we were into this method discussion. How are we doing it? Not as individuals, but across disciplines and in groups and stakeholders and so on. But I would really like go back to this very concrete empirical examples from your very different research field. So if human or human um, yeah, understanding of human as nature, uh, that as a human that is not superior to nature, but it is part of nature and all those. Um, and this is a change how we think human, I think. This is not the way some generations before people thought about humans. So I think we are in a process of understanding human differently. So if there is a if there's a connection, then how could this human nature relation look like in research projects? Like in yours, I think that's such a nice example how to understand the role of human in a groundbreaking research project differently. So I don't know if you have other examples, very concrete examples from your fields, how the human uh, yeah, gains a different role in the research process even with animals or I don't, yeah. yeah. Mm. No, I was just thinking that there is a huge change in the way we do research uh, now, uh, for example, with an indigenous peoples. If we come from the outside, we do it with them, not, you know, we don't look 
from people from the outside. So I think that could be an example of, of thinking about how you could do it with, with the non-human or other than human as well. Um, that you really, uh, I mean, as you said, you have to observe, you have to really try to imagine. Um, and I think you would ask different questions and also include. And I'm, I guess there are all these ways in the arts where you do Co try to cooperate with bacteria or whatever you know that you 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 try to imagine um, and and ha try to facilitate uh, cooperation uh, between species and between people uh, in different ways. So I think there's a lot of of things to to look at if you want to do things differently. But I think also within interdisciplinary that we instead of as you said from the beginning on with. Uh, Maybe the humanists would say, oh, maybe we could get into your project and we could help you with communication. <laughs> Instead, you would start out by, you know, when you made a project, you would gather a group and then you would look at what are we researching and then you would start by finding questions together instead of, for example, natural scientists asking the questions and then the artist or the um, art historian coming in and helping out, kind of. Um, uh, so I, I think the, the, the togetherness in, in the way we ask questions is very important for, for changing the ways we, we do research. Do you have an example from your department? <laughs> Another one that called? No. <laughs> Just no. tell us. <laughs> yes, I don't know. Like in the arts, there's a lot of like cooperations within photography at the moment, which I do a lot of research and I've been writing an article on... Um, Instead of, I mean, it's more processual, so you wouldn't think about the end product. You would, uh, for example, try out different ways of doing photography at the, si the location, maybe making the chemistry you need with the uh, seaweed, for example, uh, trying to make it sustainable um, and also make it kind of heading the process. So the end I mean, it wouldn't. It would, you would try to lose your, your control, maybe in a way. I think that's why also I'm saying all of this of failure, because also within urban transformation in the warming Arctic, which I'm part of, um, with researchers, researchers, uh, the um, uh, the urban spaces of Nuuk together with coloniality and how it's been working together. I work with artists and in that project, and I kind of went to Nuke and met artists and a lot of things haven't ended up with anything because I used a lot of time talking to them, understanding the situation, asking what would you like me to do instead of having an idea before I get go there. So, um, and for example, with one of the artists, I, I helped out uh, making a PhD application. Uh, that's part of the result, kind of. She got the P PhD um, uh, position. So instead of always in capitalism, and I mean, research is cap capitalistic in all senses. We always think about end results and all of this. Um, I think we need to think di differently about output. Where, I, I mean, we don't need to go anywhere, actually, if we're just staying there and using time and trying to figure out what can we do. And I was thinking when you were talking about it, that that's a huge kind of my frustration with natural sciences that you have, to, you need so much time to do the description or the, especially here and in the ocean. I was thinking, what a, if we transformed the, the sciences to be more activistic then instead of doing this description you would go and 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 uh, you know organize meetings then you would be more like the artist of course the artists are doing this but i w i was thinking maybe we all have to do the things we're not used to do <laughs> to kind of uh, you know facilitate um action in a way so yeah i don't know but i think i think at least i think we need to think uh, kind of rethink research, and I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. I guess there are a lot of things that are not working in in the project of natural sciences. Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, with respect to, uh, I think uh, complementary activities uh, is what uh, is uh, I would see is most beneficial. That uh, someone needs to document and to kind of provide the facts, but uh, it's not enough. And But going back to 
to humans and, and the ecosystem. For me, as an ecologist, humans are a natural part of the ecosystem. I never thought about them as anything else. I know that in discussing with other people, in especially social sciences and maybe uh, humanism, uh, we are on a collisional course uh, because uh, we just see that very different. For me, it's kind of we are competing with uh, wells or seals or whatsoever for, for the cod, uh, our way of harvesting in the forest is part of the nature. We are living in the nature with the nature of the nature. And that's what we have done for all, all the time humans have existed. We are part of the ecosystem. Uh, right now we are so many. Uh, we are also have developed so much technology that we are able to consume a lot more than uh, the earth can take. Uh, so that's when you come into a phase where you need regulation. It was needed in, uh, in fisheries management when things became more uh, automatic because uh, we, we took a lot more than what we needed for dinner that day because we could uh, earn more money, we could get rich. So uh, we could extend our footprints uh, much more. And, uh, and that's where a bit the, the challenge is. But we are a part of the ecosystem. We have always been and we are. And that's why we have a responsibility. So uh, it's kind of not a choice uh, whether we should uh, do something or not. It's our responsibility whether you call it Anthropocene or not, because uh, yeah. what we are kind of uh, heading towards is a future with uh, six, seven billion people that need food and with increasing climate change. The, there are more and more regions that become tough to live in. Uh, you mentioned Africa, but I think that islands in the Pacific is perhaps a tougher place to, to be when they are suddenly underwater. Um, so um, I, I kind of don't think that it's a discussion whether humans are part of the system or not, but the question is how to collaborate more across uh, disciplines between natural and, and human scientists to be complementary and to increase our force and impact. But I think we all agree upon that it's quite important, essential, this cross-disciplinary collaboration. But what are the challenges why why doesn't it work as we want? Or, uh, Marit, do you have some idea or experiences? Uh? I think that we have very few platforms where we sit together and talk. So if I was uh, looking at the calls from the research council and see what where I can apply uh, money, I wouldn't readily find a place where I could include a, a social scientist uh, or an artist with enough time to sit down and think how are we going to shape this project mm. and I have uh, done what you say we shouldn't I have had artists joining cruises uh, to kind of uh, uh, provide uh, visualization uh, and to communicate in different ways than we can do uh, through talks, presentations, or uh, scientific papers. Uh, and I agree, but we need these platforms, these mm. meeting places, and we need to understand uh, wh what would you like to do to address this question? And I think that just takes time. Mm. And uh, we need to find these meeting places, and this may be one of them. Mm. I was triggered when you were saying that science should be more activist kind of approach. <laughs> no, I don't know whether I should disagree or just simply take it because, I mean, I was one of the founding members of Scientists for Future in Germany like four years ago or five years ago. That's when the Fridays for Future movement in Germany became really strong. We had a bit of an impact, but it's not really about activism in the end. And I rather like your idea of uh, sitting together and see what are the perspectives to a piece of research um, together with people from the arts and the humanities. That, that I find interesting and taking enough time here. I also think that if, you, if your research is not risky enough so that there is a good chance that it fails, then it's not good science. So, because in the beginning we're saying like 
an artist can fail because that's part of the concept. But this is the same for research. If you if you know what you will get out, it will only be incremental. It will not, but it will certainly not be disruptive. And if it's disruptive, it's by chance. Sometimes we need to be lucky and have a little bit of luck and then find something that really changes the game. But in principle, if the research, and that's part of our research funding structure, I think, which are critical, that is that um, the more incremental research is easier to become funded than that risky research that where you not really you don't really know whether this is leading to anywhere. And so I think good art and good research have something in common, and that's they must be risky and they they must take the risk that it that it's a complete failure, which is okay if you're at my career stage. If you're a PhD student, you probably see it differently, yeah, because that can have a big influence on your further career. Yeah. I just want to say I quite agree there. And, you know, if it's not risky, it's almost not worth doing in a way. <laughs> 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 hence, hence the failures. <laughs> no, but I was also thinking, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, th I said this because it's the system that makes us unable to risk, you know, that's what. So, yeah, uh, with these funding systems and all of this, we kind of need to to be, uh, yeah, to not fail. So I, I don't know, I think it's about, I think we need to, and I th guess it has to do with time and money in the end. So I guess that's the problem, time and money. <laughs> and power. And power, yeah, but that comes with power. <laughs> and I just also want to say, you know, uh, sometimes uh, a lot of initiatives can seem small, you know, like collecting uh, plastic on the beach, Crash, uh, crushing a little some sea urchins here or there, uh, or, or building a, like a tiny kitty wake hotel that doesn't really solve the at all the bigger questions, but it also gives, you know, some kind of positive uh, idea that you can engage and you can do something, which I think is on the sort of human level in, in terms of being able to sort of. Uh, shape our future in a way. Uh, it's so important because it's very easy to just, uh, sort of fall into some sort of apathy or like this kind of negative spiral that it's all fucked, we can't do anything about this. So I, I think that's also a very important thing in sort of making projects, uh, however small, that but has uh, like the potential, potential for change or for some positive change. Mm. No, we have not Tone with us. Tone, who said she introduced this concept all together with her colleague of the little tools. So don't have to be big stuff all the time and big money, but it can be smaller pilot projects. It can have an impact on thinking new or, or creating new values, which we use to set up research norms and values. We haven't talked so much about language. <laughs> <laughs> Some one of you were into this concepts, what, what kind of concepts we have, also the, uh, the idea also that humanities contribute with specific type of uh, a specific type of language or the way of talking <laughs> about very complex things is something that I think uh, can be brought into interdisciplinary project very early uh, so one is the time sitting together and using time and having a different pace of thinking but the other is really also thinking new concepts new language um, that are historically like rooted somehow but also go to future concepts so there's so many ways that humanities can bring in and the arts can bring in i don't know Ante uh, Marie -Therese, if you had something you would like to because now we are quite yeah, our quite time far is into running future <laughs> i just want yeah. um, just to follow up this this discussion what are the challenges and we identified um, it's in a way also the um, the financial system the, the research funding system but i also want to to, to point at we are all working as teachers at the at university Universities. Mm -hmm. So also we ourselves, we have the possibility <coughs> to educate students to think a little bit in another way. What is the output of research? Uh, should it also, couldn't it be also risky and uh, not only the safe way? So it's, I think it's also a little bit about 
our the seniors here, not the peers, <laughs> as the professors and and Verstammenoensis and so on. So so we could do something also with our way in teaching the the next generation and um, yeah engage them thinking probably a little bit more risky <laughs> and just to make a, a difference. So th it came just came up to me when we had that discussion about what are the challenges obstacles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there something like some final comments? <laughs> I could just uh, draw up this uh, study in landscape uh, architecture at UIT that actually won a prize because they have been able to build an interdisciplinary study with ecologists and uh, uh, architects, so uh, understanding and integrating into the education, the landscape or knowledge about the ecology. And so that's a, a good example of yeah. how we can do it. So uh, it's a good way to continue. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Is there no more? Yes, Christoph. Mm, yeah, I was thinking about language because language can be so different. I mean, in 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 my field of research, part of the language is simple simply mathematics. Mm. That's also a very nice language, um, and. Well, by now we can translate between different languages um, using artificial intelligence systems, which which may help. But um, for ex in the German broadcasting now, we very often have also like news in simple language. So the regular news are then taken again and put into an another language that would be good for elderly people, which have like um, some problem hearing fast language and complicated language of for children and I think this is very good um, and if we would find some kind of um, translation between between the the sciences and the arts and the humanities using good conversions between different languages and then all the time changing the perspective when you change the language that that would be good, and I I, I think it would rec uh, require an artist also to look at the formula, and it would require a mathematician also to look at a painting or a, or a photograph, and really get into the different perspectives that come along with it. I think this is this would trigger new insight and and new knowledge just simply by constantly going around and changing perspectives, and that'll be good for the Arctic but it'll be good for the planet anyway. And good for ourselves. That's why we have the Spotify playlist. I hope everyone watched this. This is a way of communicating across disciplines. We choose music that relate to the topic. So um, different communications in different languages, I think, is probably the key to, to go forward with those <laughs> quite complex uh, topics. And I would like to say thank you for everyone in the panel to joining and discussing and everyone listening to this kind of open research, because that's the way we normally sit on teams and talk. So today we got the possibility to talk uh, physically and now we go take a picture and go to eat. And uh, thank you for having you all here. This will be this was streamed and will be online on YouTube. You can watch it and share it with your colleagues later if you found this interesting. And I hope you have a wonderful conference. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>